how did the women's movement, which fought for equal opportunity in education and the workplace, and the sexual revolution, which reduced women to ambitious sex objects, become so united? Many people don't know this story, and my new friend Sue Ellen Browder wrote a phenomenal book on how all of this happened in her very page-turning personal account book called Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. Sue Browder documents for the first time how it all happened in her own life and in the life of an entire country. Sue was trained at the University of Missouri School of Journalism to be an investigative journalist. She unwittingly betrayed her true calling and became a propagandist for the sexual revolution. As a staff writer for Cosmopolitan, she wrote pieces meant to soft sell unmarried sex, contraception, and abortion as the single woman's path to personal fulfillment. She did not realize until much later that propagandists higher and cleverer than herself were influencing her thinking and her personal choices as they subverted the women's movement. But her thirst for truth that led her into journalism in the first place eventually led her to find forgiveness and freedom, and she has been sounding the trumpet and illuminating a way forward for others who have also suffered from the unholy alliance between the women's movement and the sexual revolution. You are in for a treat. Buckle up. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs> Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. It is really good to meet you. I told you off air that I, I ripped through this book in a very short time period, uh, shortly after the country shut down with quarantines and all of that in uh, early 2020. And I had heard about it from my friend Lila Rose in live action, um, but I regret not having read it sooner. And this is, it's, it's such a powerful story because very few people actually know what happened. They view the sexual revolution and the women's movement as one and the same. But as you detail in your book, that is not initially how all of that happened. And one of the first lines in your book, actually, Sue, is, is you said, in the beginning, the women's movement and the sexual revolution were distantly separate cultural phenomena. Um, and so I think to, yes. that's right, exactly. So to understand how we got here, I think it's important to dive into this. And, and I, I, before we do, because I, I want you to just go because you're such a good storyteller um, and I really think you'll bless our listeners. Um, but I was so moved by your book afterwards, Sue, that I wrote a, sh a, a review on Goodreads as I try to do for books I read to sort of summarize my understanding of the book. Um, I want to read it for you. Uh, so you let me know how well you think I understood your book, and then, and then I want you to tell parts of your story. So I, I, here's what I wrote down right after I finished your book. I said, Browder gives her readers front row tickets to one of the greatest political stunts of the 20th century and traces the political actors involved in that stunt to get the women's movement in bed with the sexual revolution. To the great harm of women, families, and preborn children, that stunt was successful. This infidelity conceived what we now know today as the pro-choice movement. Driven by the motivations of a shockingly small number of individuals, a political propaganda campaign was launched to persuade the National Organization for Women and their fearless founder, Betty Friedan, to adopt abortion on demand within their political platform. While Friedan maintained that it was unrealistic to be a feminist who was anti-family, the propagandists of choice insisted that the complete legalization of abortion is the one just and inevitable answer to the quest for feminine freedom. Built on lies, false data, and a perversion of science, this propaganda campaign was so successful in convincing Americans that two and two really could equal five, that Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackmun absorbed the premises of this campaign to build his argument in the majority opinion of Roe versus Wade. Browder carefully and graciously explains how this stunt was pulled, her role in helping pull it off, and the pain and suffering such seemingly noble ideas caused in her life and, the, and millions of others. Ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. Browder is shockingly honest in how she became a victim of the bad ideas she absorbed and helped promulgate. Come sit with Browder in the front row to both the sexual revolution and her own life, and she will break your heart, boil your blood, and send you out better informed and equipped to love women, men, and their preborn children. Did I get it? I think it is. I don't think we need to talk anymore. I think you finished it. <laughs> 
but but honestly, That's Sue, good. Um, That's good. I I want to know your story. So how does a small town Iowa girl um, end up in New York City writing for Cosmopolitan? Okay, well, I wanted to be rich and famous, <laughs> and and I was a small town girl. I went to the University of Missouri School of Journalism, which was one of the best schools of journalism in the country. It was the first one founded. Wow. And uh, they taught us that the people have a right to know. Okay, so they taught us good journalistic standards. And But one of the um, assignments I had in the magazine class that I took was to choose a magazine and tell the people that, that in my class, how would you write for this magazine? How would you, what, what, would you, what would you do? And I chose Cosmopolitan because Cosmopolitan was the leading women's magazine in the 1960s and 70s. Right. So I chose Cosmopolitan and I analyzed it and I said, you know, these stories look to me like they're made up because mm -hmm. they were just too packed. They didn't look real. And then after I got married, my husband was a, a writer as well. We both wanted to be freelance writers. And uh, we went to New York City, and I applied for a job in the New York Times. Didn't know where it was. And it turned mm. out it was Cosmopolitan Magazine. <laughs> wow. And there, were, wow. and there were 18 people that applied for that job, and I got it. Wow. No way. And, and you know how I got it? I told the, I was the articles editor, so I was in the articles department, and I told the articles editor, she said, why do you want to have this job? And I said, because I want to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You said that in the book. Yeah. No, I want to be like me. <laughs> That's and so right. I got the job. And I was actually, I was actually on staff only about six months. My, I was a writer for the magazine for the next 20 years. I, did, I was a freelance writer for the magazine. So, but while I was there on staff in 1971, I think it was, so I have to go back and say, see, yeah, it was 71. It was very clear to me at that time that the women's movement and the sexual revolution, which the Cosmo was promoting, were radically different movements. Uh, Helen Curley Brown, who was the who was the editor at, of Cosmopolitan at that That's time, right. turned Cosmo into a sex rag. It had been a general interest magazine, and it was failing. And she turned it into the sex wow. rag. Wow! And <laughs> wanted Betty Friedan, who had founded the women's movement in with her, or had launched the women's movement with her 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique. She wanted right. Betty Friedan to write for Cosmo. Betty would have nothing to do with it. Wow. The, I'm sitting in the in the articles department trying to get Betty Friedan or following people who are trying to get Betty Friedan to write for Cosmopolitan and seeing the message that she didn't want to have anything to do with it. Hmm. So there were two separate movements. So after years later, I left Cosmo eventually and I went on and I wrote for the Reader's Digest and, and all of these other places. And then I became a Catholic. And one of my friends said, well, I said they were two radically different movements. And I said, well, how, she said, well, how did they get joined together? And you see, I didn't know. This book that you're reading is the book that I, this was investigative reporting. I had to find out. I said, mm. you know, I don't really know. She says, was it abortion? I said, yeah. I think you're right. Wow. It was the question of a friend of mine that opened the door to this book. And I started to look at what happened and I started to investigate. And then I got wow. to the, okay, so I got to the point where I was, I had investigated it quite a bit. And, I, and, and you'll, as you, you'll see in the book, there was a man, actually two men, but especially one man named Larry Lady, who was a magazine writer who knew Betty Friedan very well. And he was the one that in, encouraged her and urged her and, and convinced her to insert abortion into the women's movement. That's and, one, right, yeah. you know, and the night that it happened, and it took me, it took me years to find out this time. It was November 18th, 1967, in the Chinese room of the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. The very, there were only about 100 people, 100 people that had met at the National Organization for Women's Second annual conference. It was a small mm. group. And um, that night, they, they created the 
National Organization for Women's Bill of Rights. And most of those things in that Bill of Rights were things we will all agree with. People don't really forget that women were being fired for being pregnant. I was fired for being pregnant in 1970. So, wow. well, yeah, people forget that. So one of the one of the um, law, the things, the rights that they wanted in their Bill of Rights was that women shouldn't be fired for being pregnant. No reason. Another of the rights was um, that families should have um, uh, be able to deduct child care from their income tax. These were family. Right. These are family rights, but there was that one right that, um, was, which was the abortion right. And Betty Friedan, who had, had never even mentioned abortion in the original in the original book, right. um, turned abortion into the women's movement that night. It was the last right they were voted on, and it created an absolute uproar. People mm -hmm. were furious, screaming. People. It sounds it sound like America today. People were saying, I'm against murder. And they, they, they were, there, was, there was a total uproar. When the dust settled that night, it was almost midnight on November 18, 1957, in the Chinese room, when the dust settled, only 57 people, mere 57 people, had voted to insert abortion into the National Organization for Women's Bill of Rights. And that's what wow. we're those 57 people and one third of those women walked out of that room and later resigned from now over the abortion vote. And where <laughs> these were pro life Christians who said one of them was named Betty Boyd and she was an attorney. She said a, a baby is a sacred trust. She said a baby is a sacred trust. She went back to Ohio and founded an organization called the Women's Equity Action. It was a feminist organization. And these women fought in the courts for all of these family rights. They fought to get the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1968 passed. They fought for all of these family rights that they were trying to, trying to get through Congress. And they lost. When I was in Cleveland, that's where Betty Boyer had started this Women's Equity Action. I spoke to a pro-life group there. They'd never heard of it. Wow. People worked underground. Now, why? Why were they not in the New York Times and all over the place because they were winning all these things? Why not? Most of them, I spoke to Betty Boyer's niece. I interviewed her. She said most, all these women had jobs. They were, they were, you know, they were being, they were employed. They didn't want their employers to know that they were out there marching in the street, crazy women. So they stayed undercover as much as they could. They stayed very quiet and did their work quietly. These were pro-life Christian women who want so many of the rights that we have today. And the one right that we're still fighting for is abortion. Why? Because Certainly for the National Organization for Women's um, Bill of Rights through propaganda, through, yeah. through this first leader who had written a book. And I've got this book here. Okay, let, let, me, get, let me get this book for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can do that. Mike, this can book. you turn her up a little more in my ear? Here you go. This and then is the Sue, book. can you just speak a little bit louder, Sue? This is the book that one of the books that convinced Betty Friedan to, that abortion was a woman's right. And written by Larry Later, it's just called Abortion. Now listen to this, uh, this subtitle, because this subtitle is a, is a masterpiece of propaganda, okay? He calls his book Abortion. This whole book is just full of half-truth, selective truth, and truth out of context, which is what uh, um, propaganda is. We think okay. propaganda is a bunch of lies. No, it's a bunch of twisted truths. That's right. And it's very hard to discern. Okay, so listen to this subtitle. Abortion, he just calls it abortion. Subtitle, the first authoritative and documented report on the laws and practices governing abortion in the U.S. and around the world and how, for the sake of women everywhere, 
they can and must be reformed. Wow. And I want to I want to talk about Larry later, um, Sue, because he has been called by some almost the father of oh, the yeah. sexual revolution. And of course, you and I would probably add Hugh Hefner and, and of course others as well. But when you talk about abortion um, and you're talking about the mid and late 60s and early 70s, you're talking about a few men and really the fountainhead of that degeneracy and rot is Larry Later. Um, let me set it up, and then I want you to tell us about this man, the degenerate that he truly was, Sue. Um, but he was one of the founders of the National Abortion Rights Action League. He was Margaret Sanger's biographer. He worked for years to convince Betty Friedan to insert abortion into the National Organization for Women's Political Platform. And I want to tell you, I want you to tell us how he worked on her to, do, to pull that off. But he called pregnancy the ultimate punishment of sex, um, he wrote in the book you just held up for us, Sue, he wrote, the complete legalization of abortion is the one just and inevitable answer to the quest for feminine freedom. Um, well, it sounds a little bit like the patriarchy, patriarchy to me there, Sue. So, um, so just a little setup there for our listeners about this, this disgusting man. Uh, tell us about Larry Later, his influence, and his uh, relentless quest to get Betty Friedan to insert abortion into the NOWS platform? Well, he was a magazine writer along with Betty Friedan, so he knew her very well in New York City. And as I say, he worked for many years to try to get her to understand that women needed abortion. Now, to, as, to, to be set free. Now, to be fair, listen to this. Betty Friedan had also been fired for being pregnant in the 1940s. So just as I had was fired for being pregnant in 1970. So on some level, it may have made sense to her. Dr. Bernard Nathanson was, uh, I'm sure that name is familiar with you. Dr. Yeah. Bernard Nathanson worked with Larry Later to found the National Organization, or the NARAL, what's now, now called NARAL Portraits America. Yeah. And he was the one that spilled the beans. If it hadn't been for um, that doctor, Dr. Nathanson, I went to a conference with, with, where he was spoke uh, shortly after I became Catholic. And he was the one that spilled the beans and told about all the propaganda they used to sell abortion to the American people. Right. So, so without his testimony inside, we would never know completely what happened. So as an investigative reporter, the first thing, that, that conference where Dr. Bernard Nathanson revealed all the lies that they had told was, was a changing point for me because I thought, wow, if they were lying to sell abortion, and we were lying at Cosmo to sell the sexual revolution, and Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey, had been lying with his science, then the whole sexual revolution was built on lies. Yeah, it was all, it was all a whole cloth. It was all made up. And, and the amazing thing is people bought it. People right. bought it. And, and I, I will be honest with you, when I was at the National, when I was at Cosmo, when I was telling all, see, Betty, um, Helen Gurley Brown actually had a list of uh, rules on how to lie to the American public. I've got it right here. I kept it for 50 years. Amazing. <laughs> right rules for cosmopolitan. You probably can't see that. But anyway. Wow. <laughs> and so quickly, to just to refresh my listeners, Helen Gurley Brown, you guys, uh, was the <laughs> editor-in-chief of Cosmo. She was the author of Sex and the Single Girl. And uh, before, I want you to tell us about Helen Gurley Brown, but here's something she, she claimed, if this is from your book, Sue, she claimed that what held women back from success in the workplace was, quote, this built-in mechanism in their bodies that allows them to have babies. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't sound very feminist or embracing the feminist strength that they have biologically given to them by God. <laughs> She wasn't. She wasn't really a feminist. She was a she was a ambitious lady who wanted to make a lot of money. Now this is interesting because she was also promoting. She was a promoting abortion. She was a promoting um, divorce. 
she had, being the gay divorcee it was supposed to be so wonderful then wow. see i'm behind the scenes this is why i didn't buy into it she was married to the same man for 40 years 50, hmm. I'm, I mean, sorry 50 years she was wow. married to the same man for 50 years um the women at cosmo were married uh, most of them happily um i was happily married so here we were telling these lies that you know just get out there the hookup culture it's so wonderful you'll have so much fun wow. of course it was it was all made up that is fascinating um, isn't that sort of a core tenet of elitism sue is, is sort of free sex for thee but not for me abortions right. for thee but not for me interesting Helen wow. early brown said that if her husband david had had an affair she'd kill him and then in Meanwhile, the she was selling sex. And yeah, free sex. In the wow. she was selling all these other women to have affairs with married men. Wow, that and, is and shocking. Would, we would do um, articles on, you know, these women were always having affairs with married men, and, and you know, it, it was all made up. And, and it, it sells, as I said, yeah. Sex and the City, the uh, television show, was a ripoff, if you will, or a... Uh, the same thing as cosmopolitan cosmo wow. the cosmo lifestyle has been promoted now throughout the whole culture and yep. why 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 is has it, are so many people promoting the cosmo culture why is it in the um magazines why is it in the newspapers why is it in, on, in hollywood i was at a conference with a bunch of young ladies in uh, who were you know in, I think we were in Phoenix, and I was talking to these young ladies, and I, I held up a picture of Cosmopolitan with this scantily clad lady on it, and I says, why do you think they do this? And one little sophomore said, money. <laughs> right. It sells. It sells, yeah. right? Because the woman's body is beautiful. Everybody wants to look, you know? Um, and so here she is, a sophomore, from the mouths of babes, money. It was all about money. It made yeah, that's right. money. That's right. Wow. And <clears throat> Sue, uh, I, I found it fascinating in your book. And again, you guys, you have to go get Sue Ellen Browder's book, Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. Um, but in your book, you, you, you do a phenomenal job explaining the difference be between Betty Friedan, right, who's this, that, you know, today is viewed by the third wave feminists as a hero, but many of them don't understand how opposed she was to the sexual revolution. Um, for example, when Gloria Steinem called marriage a form of prostitution, and you quote, you quote in your book Ferdan's response to Gloria Steinem, and Betty Ferdan responded to Gloria Steinem saying, that extreme form of thinking tends to come from women who hate having to deal with the complexities of juggling a career and a family. And so almost literally, they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And then she says, it's just unrealistic to be a feminist who is anti-family. Um, so Betty Friedan was more in this first wave feminist mold, but people like Larry Later, they worked on her to get her to embrace abortion. Can you talk about how long Larry Later um, and others worked on Betty Friedan and leading up to that 1967 second annual conference where they inserted it into their platform? Yes, so he said that he had worked on her for a long time, many, many years. We don't know exactly what he said to her to convince her that abortion needed to be inserted in the women's movement. And so basically, which joined the sexual revolution with the women's movement very right. tightly. Uh, we don't know what ex exactly he said to her but there was some indication, I think something that, thought, that Dr. Bernard Nathanson said, that he convinced her that Congress wouldn't pass all of her other demands if she didn't insert abortion into that. Because you could say to the to Congress at the time, remember these were women were being fired for being pregnant. So you could right. say to corporate America, look boys, uh, you know, she's, She'll, she'll be on the pill, and if the pill fails, she can get an abortion. So you can go, go ahead and give women all these other rights because she can take care of all that. And that, mm -hmm. isn't that what we're being told today? Women, you take care of it. You take care of it. That's right. Um, That's right. It's not my wow. it's your problem. Not my problem. And, That's right. Uh, wow. Yeah. A yeah. gift to the patriarchy once again. 
Um, Sue, when you explained this November 18th, uh, listen guys, November 18th, 1967, <coughs> was what Sue was talking about, powerful, tragic moment when the National Organization for Women officially adopted a pro-abortion position. And you said in your book, now simultaneously became both the National Organization for Women and the National Organization Against Motherhood, a living <coughs> contradiction. Um, and of course, that's the point that you and me and others as pro-lifers make is that of course, abortion is extremely anti-women, firstly for the pre-born women who are murdered in abortion, where are their women's rights? And secondly, because it, it reduces women down to their uteruses rather than as an image bearer of God with a purpose and a telos that God gave you. No, 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 it's just these pesky uteruses, says Helen Gurley Brown, these built-in mechanisms that make us not able to achieve the same level of, of, of success in the workplace. But that book you held up, and man, I would love to find one of those one day. Uh, l l you mentioned in the book, Sue, that Larry Later built much of his um, book and uh, alleged facts on this Bunks history created by a man named Cyril Means. Um, so as we keep talking about how all this happened, I want our listeners to understand the, the figures that were at play in this. Um, yeah. And then I want you to tell a little bit more of how God worked in your life. But, but who is Cyril Means? Uh, how did him and Larry later work together? And what did they accomplish? Well, they worked together in the area the National Association to Repeal Abortion Laws, which was, that was the way they were approaching, Amer Pro-Choice America was originally called. Right. And he was a lawyer, Cyril Means was a lawyer, and he wrote a history, a false history of abortion, which was then quoted in the, in the Roe v. Wade uh, seven times, and Larry Later's bogus book, a, a book by a magazine writer that would <laughs> Had, had all sorts of errors in it, was quoted by Harry Blackman in Roe v. Wade another seven times. So you've got these two NARAL men um, who are basically wrote the foundation of Roe v. Wade. The interesting thing about Roe v. Wade, and then that's why we get into Cyril Means, because he wrote, he published these articles, these fake um articles on the history of abortion in respectable journals. Okay. So you've got these this these lies being promoted in respectable journals and then being quoted in Roe v. Wade. What I understood as a writer, pe people don't understand that when when a piece of writing is done, it is the organization, it is the unseen organization that and form of the writing that is convincing. Mm. Larry Later knew how to write a convincing form. And it was, it was that convincing form that has been so controversial in Roe v. Wade. Even, even liberal attorneys who are pro-choice have, have said that Roe v. Wade is just full of, of historic errors. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's based on this magazine writer's invention of history, which he got from Cyril Bemeen's invention of history. They work together. Wow. The reason, so what happened is, once I started writing uh, uh, Subverted, I got as far as chapter four. Well, it may be a different chapter right now because things these chat things change. But I got as far as for how did Larry Later's book get inserted into Will Be Wade? How did that happen? Right. And so I I wanted to go to the national or to to Congress or to the uh, to Washington D.C. to the Library of Congress to see how that happened. Hmm. And I had run, I, I, I had no money. I, I, I had become Christian. <laughs> and so, so my, my secular income had dried up. <laughs> and 
I was working at, I was selling jewelry with pennies, JC pennies. Wow. <laughs> Good writing for this book, and I, didn't, I couldn't get to, I had no money to go to D.C., to the Library of Congress, and I ran into the, uh, through Providence, <laughs> Divine Providence, um, the, uh, the uh, editor of Ignatius Press. Hmm. And I told him, I'm, you know, I used to write for Cosmopolitan, and he said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll buy your book and send you to these, give you some enough money wow. to see. So I went yeah. to these and read the Blackman papers, and that's when I found that it wasn't actually Harry Blackman so much who inserted that false history into the women's movement, or into the Roe v. Wade. It was his 28-year-old law clerk, George mm. Brandon. That's right. Him. Talk about that. <laughs> Excellent writer. Harry Blackman was a good old boy. He was a Republican. He had a bunch of, he had three daughters, I think. He he had gone he had worked at the Mayo Clinic. You know, he was a lawyer for the Mayo Clinic. Um he had never thought about abortion. And here he was being assigned this job of writing Roe v. Wade. And he had clue. And he was having a terrible time, terrible time writing it. And finally he went, this is something interesting he did that I didn't know that Supreme Court justices do. He couldn't write it and he couldn't on what the arguments were in the court. So he went out to the Mayo Clinic to, to do his own research on abortion. What? You know wow. Supreme Court justices do? They don't listen to the arguments in court. They go out and do their own research. I don't know, but he did anyway. That's what he did. And while he was out there in uh, in St. Paul or at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, um, his 28 year old law clerk, fifteen thousand dollars a year, was back in in D.C. writing the history of this thing, and he's the one that picked up. This and wow. And he's and and also Cyril Means. So he's the one that wrote that history. Harry Blackman wow. later that I did all my own research. I know it's right. Really? Wow. What was that law clerk's name that Blackman had write the decision? What I beg your pardon? What's that? What what did you say? What was Blackman's law clerk? Who was who was his name that, was that he George, had? George. Say it Brown. again. Okay. Yeah, George Frampton. He's still alive, and uh, he's wow. he quite a, a, an environmentalist. He's a, quite an, you know. Shocker. Well, Love the, yeah. Protect the planet, see? kill the babies. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, Typical. Larry, Larry later uh, even wrote a book called Breathing Ourselves to Death. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Breathing Ourselves to Death. So, wow. yes. So this this grew out of the population control movement. You know, yes. we're all going to kill ourselves. We're all going to die because of starvation because we have got too many babies. You know. That's right. Well, and Sue, you do a, a really good job explaining the different parties at play and how they work together in your book. On your point just now, Sue, about the population bomb. Oh, we're going to have too many babies. We have to we have to have contraception and abortion, particularly of poor black people. It's you know people don't understand how eugenicist and racist um, yeah. many of these people were. But on your point, you mentioned in your book that one of Larry Later's um, primary influences after Margaret Sanger, okay, uh, and after uh, Cyril Means was Hugh Moore. Hugh Moore was a multimillionaire yeah. and the author of that pamphlet, that famous pamphlet called The Population Bomb. Which, which predicted that in like a couple decades or whatever it was, a few decades, we were going to all be starving, not have enough resources. And then by the time frame that the population bomb predicted there would be this bomb that destroyed everything, we were richer, fatter, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and more unhealthy because of too, many, too much junk food and food available to us. Um, and, and Hugh Moore believed that um, too many babies, particularly among the poor, were the root causes of poverty, crime, and wars. And so people just had to be stopped from reproducing. And if not, then they needed to just abort their children. And many of those early eugenicists with uh, you know, the uh, Population Council, for example, 
Uh, some of these guys who, who were on the board of the Population Council and who helped found it, who were best friends with Margaret Sanger, they recommended things like putting a fertility control agent in the waters of urban neighborhoods. Um, yeah. I mean, this is some of the things that they talked about. These people were disgusting human beings. Um, but just to make the point, to put the cap on it, that like Cyril Means, Larry Later, Hugh Moore, Margaret Sanger, like all of these people were either friends or were influencing one another. Um, and, and, and it really built out all of what we call today secular progressivism. These were the intellectual fountainheads of that um, sort of political philosophy or what I call, Sue, an alternative religion. But I, I want you to discuss a little bit about your story, Sue, before we wrap up. Uh, you've done a brilliant job explaining how this happened and how Helen Gurley Brown and Cosmo were selling sex a lot and a lifestyle that they themselves weren't living and how they were serving as, as sort of journalistic prostitutes for the culture of death, and how they, uh, Larry Later and, and others were working to break down Betty for Dan to make this unholy alliance. And your book does a phenomenal job at that. But, but your story, your story is, is phenomenal as well. Uh, when did you begin to wake up? When did you begin to realize that you had been believing and selling lies? And then how did God work through you and your family? You tell a, your beautiful family story in this book, but tell us a little bit about that. We had, we had a beautiful, I had a beautiful marriage, 40 years, the most wonderful marriage. We just, we, we had a beautiful marriage. When did I finally, it was a slow process. I, first of all, I didn't realize people would buy all those lies. I did. I just did not realize how pervasive that would become, how totalitarian that image, those images of women would become, and how much people would buy those lies. I left Cosmo. My last article published in Cosmo was in the early 1990s. I le and I'd already left Cosmo and was actually writing for the Reader's Digest and for places that actually had fact checkers. <laughs> and and uh, I actually wrote a book, I wrote an article at that time called Mom, I Want to Live with My Boyfriend because my daughter was in that place. And I, and I had wrote all these, I had done all this research on how dangerous that was for women, how, you know, how it hurt them so much. And, and so I wrote this, that was in, that was in the Reader's Digest. Um, so I, I slow, it was a slow, slow, slow process. In the middle of all of this, these lies with Cosmopolitan, though, I became pregnant with my third child. My husband and I had two children. I'd been fired for being pregnant, and we were, again, we had gotten, I were writing, we were both writing, but we weren't making a lot of money at that time. In fact, we were on food stamps at that time, um, working temporary jobs, and it was a downturn. We both were beginning to lose our jobs, but I did not want to lose my job and be fired for being pregnant when I was helping to support this family. So both of us, at that time, I believed if I I had an abortion, okay, I would never have had an abortion if it hadn't been for Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is, was a teacher. It belongs a teacher. And, and I had an abortion in 1974, one year after Roe v. Wade. I would never have sought out an illegal abortionist. I could have an abortion in the Hartford Hospital where I'd given birth to my first child. First, yes, wow. first. And, um, Both my husband and I thought, believed, that the, the propaganda, that this was just a clump of cells. It was, I was only pregnant, um, it was about six weeks into my pregnancy, I got them very early, and it was very painful. Women don't realize how painful this can be. It was very painful. And as I was on that operating table, the doctor who was mad about having to do this, now this was a year after Roe v. Wade, I don't know if he, if the hospital had insisted that he be the one that would do abortions or whatever, but he didn't let that anesthetic set. He was so mad. And he said, and, and as he did that abortion, he said, I usually deliver them alive. Wow. I was on that operating table. I stopped. I literally stopped. I sucked in and stopped breathing. There was a beautiful nurse black nurse there at my head, she almost thought I'd She said, Sue, Sue, 
she was very worried. Um, so it was at that moment, I knew you had to live from a lot, that I realized what I meant. Mm -hmm. But you cannot admit what you did to yourself because it's too painful to kill your own child. So it goes underground. It goes underground into your own calling. And after that, you just, I, for many years, I had this beautiful life. I had love, a wonderful husband. My career took off. I was winning all these prizes. I was no for show. I was doing all this stuff. I was very successful. And yet there was this anxiety and depression, complete, torturing. And it wasn't until I came into the Catholic Church and went to confession and confessed that abortion that I was born. Wow. Wow. And we're talking, let's see, from I was 28 to 30, I was 27 to 57. So we're talking 30 years that I, that I suffered from that without realizing what it was. And it, so abortion leads, leads to a very troubled, can lead to a very troubled life. And these women were saying, oh, I'm so glad I had my abortion. They haven't gotten there yet. They, it, right. it, it will, it will hit them eventually, what they did. and Or, or they just refuse to admit it right now because they're getting all these accolades for saying that, that, they're, that this is the right thing to do. They think it's liberating, but it's not. The only liberation is God's forgiveness, and that's what I found. And yeah, amen. And that's wonderful. Sue, what would you, <clears throat> what would you say to, um, if you were sitting down with a, uh, with a pink-haired, uh, pro-choice feminist uh, majoring in, in lesbian dance theory at UC Berkeley, uh, which is actually, it actually is a major, right? There is a major called lesbian dance theory. Um, and you were sitting down with a 21-year-old at UC Berkeley um, who has just bought her ticket to DC um, next week for the March for Life um, and is going to be counter-protesting uh, outside of the steps of the Supreme Court. And you had uh, her out to coffee for 30 minutes. Um, what would you tell a woman like that and women like that who um, have, are, are drinking deeply from the streams of secular progressivism um, but don't, uh, don't realize that someone's poisoned the water hole and, and they haven't woken up to the lies that you did wake up to? What would you tell that generation? Well, of course, I, that's why I wrote these books. I actually wrote another book called Sex and the Catholic Feminist. So I've written two mm -hmm. books to try to get to these ladies. But we did have, I live in Wyoming, uh, in a little town called Lander. Wyoming Catholic College is here. And we had a, um, a, a 40 Days for Life. People were praying. And, and we had a counter people across the way. I did not go over, but I wanted to go over and say, you don't want to do this. You do not do this. Uh, if you haven't had an abortion, you do not want to do this. If you have had an abortion, it's time to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, you don't want to do this. I don't know if that pink-haired lady would listen to me. <laughs> yeah. every, every little seed we plant makes a difference, doesn't it? That's right. That's right. And, you know, the left has been planting their seeds, their oh. ideological seeds in the culture and all of our institutions and formative cultural uh, institutions <clears throat> for many, many decades, right? This is what the left uh, theorists call the long walk through the institutions. They're very patient in taking oh. over institutions that are culturally and politically formative. Um, and yet not enough people um, have the sort of philosophical and spiritual insight you do to recognize through your book and your work that we need to be planting the seeds of good ideas. Um, and even if we aren't the ones there for the harvest, um, someone else will be. Um, and we have to contend for truth and for life um, to, to steward what God has given us in, this, in this, uh, this great country, but not as free of a country as it used to be. Um, and so much of that, I believe, Sue, goes back to our um, apathy towards and our tolerating of abortion. This is the stain um, on our country, and it, it is the litmus test of whether we still embrace and believe those foundational principles of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, Sue, uh, where can people get your books um, and learn more about 
about you as well? It's all it's all it's all on, all on Amazon. I'm sorry to say, you can go. <laughs> There's there's a there's another website bookfinder.com where you can get you can bypass Amazon and go to some other books. <laughs> so <laughs> good, good. And um, do you have a website or do you still do speaking as well? I do speak. Um, the uh, COVID thing has kind of stopped that speaking for the moment. I do it mostly online. You know, I don't have a website. <laughs> I one, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, so, well, you are, like, you are a gift to the country, a gift to the church, certainly, Sue. Um, and if we could get the pastors in America and the priests to, to read your book and understand where these ideas come from and the damage that they've wrought, maybe they would be a little bit more engaged in the public square to advocate for good ideas. <laughs> a lot of them have. Wow, man. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Well, Sue, thank you for joining the show today. We, we'll, we'll put a, a link to your, your book so people can get it. And uh, guys, I, I really encourage you to go pick it up. Let Sue see a little uh, jump in her book sales and bless her and bless yourself by becoming aware. Once again, subverted how I helped the sexual revolution hijack the women's movement um, and your personal stories tied throughout um, the um, uh, how, explaining the agenda of how this was all pulled off. Um, is really powerful and, and certainly something that I wish we could get into our college curriculums in the feminist theory classes that they talk about. Uh, so say, thank you, Sue. Thank you for all that you've done and that you're doing. We'll be praying for you. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Uh, thank you guys for joining the show today. Uh, again, pick up Sue's book. It, it, it is one of the most powerful books I've read on abortion and how all of this happened. And I think maybe the only one out there that's going to give you that front lines uh, front seat uh, uh, show to how all of this happened from someone who was there and, and helped and helped do it. And praise God for how God has worked through Sue's life. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter, to see my speaking schedule, or to book me for an event as the spring and uh, early summer of 2022 is already filling up quickly. I will be in D.C. next week. Uh, with an Airbnb, since I'm not going to show my yellow star, um, excuse me, my, my papers uh, to get into a hotel. We'll be doing some interviews there. I'll try to troll some pro-abortion uh, men and women as gently as I can and get them to re-examine their rotten premises. Um, and then I'll be out to Dallas-Fort Worth and then our big Love Life California conference on January 29th. Please don't miss it. I would love to see you there. We will should have just over a thousand people, but we're expecting a big bonkers um, jump in the conference on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, this coming Sunday, January 16th. Um, if you want to take advantage of that, plan to get down to Southern California, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, okay, January 29th. Get down there the night before, January 28th. Myself, Kurt Cameron, Nick Vujicic, Melissa Odin, the abortion survivor, Anthony Leventino, the former abortionist, um, and more guests as well, and breakout sessions to educate, encourage, and equip you to engage so we can take that statement about California, that what happens in California doesn't stay in California, and we can reclaim that phrase for righteousness, that if the people of God wake up to retake life in California, we flip the entire script and we can literally end abortion and save the country. So go to lovelifecalifornia.org, lovelifecalifornia.org. Use my code unaborted25, unaborted25 for 25% off all ticket sales. You're not going to want to miss this conference. It's going to be one of the largest pro-life conferences actually uh, in the country, but it's for the church. It's not for pro-life activists already engaged. It's to wake up the most powerful organism for change in the world, the bride of Christ, the church of Christ. So I want to see you there on January 29th. Thank you for tuning in today. Please leave the show a rating and review. It really helps us reach more people. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs>